Good morning. Uh, you are very welcome to our service of worship here in St. Field Road Presbyterian Church. If you're visiting, uh, we are particularly welcome. We're glad that you're with us, whether you're here in person or watching at home. And we pray that the Lord will bless you for being part of this service. My name is Alistair McCracken, part of the leadership team here. And our minister, the Reverend Ben Walker, is leading the service this morning in Beaver Presbyterian Church. And later in the service, our assistant minister, uh, Andrew, will be speaking from God's word. And Andy Bill, it's the morning of Andrews and Andys, uh, will be talking to the children. We come as one people to worship the living God. Psalm 63, verse 1 says, O God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your own feeling love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. Let's stand together as we sing, Come People of the Risen King. Let's pray together. Our Father, we worship you because you are a good God. You are a powerful God. You are a holy God. You are a living God. In a broken, war-torn, dangerous and challenging world, we know that we can trust in you and depend on your great love and grace and mercy. We ask that you come close to everyone here this morning, whether on church or watching online. 
And like the disciples who witnessed the transfiguration of our Lord, we ask that we will be able to say, Lord, it is good for us to be here. In the silence of our hearts, we confess our sins to you. We have said things that which would have been better unsaid. Forgive us, we pray. We've had lustful, angry, unkind, evil thoughts which have damaged our relationships. Forgive us, we pray. We have fed our minds on unclean images and material which have polluted our inner beings. Forgive us, we pray. We have failed to appreciate your goodness to us, which has impoverished our lives. Forgive us, we pray. We have missed opportunities to serve others in your name. Forgive us, we pray. We ask for and hold tight to the promise of forgiveness we have through the sacrificial death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we humbly ask you to move amongst us this morning. May your word be alive and cause our hearts to burn. And may we know and enjoy the presence of the living Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. If the boys and girls would like to come forward to the front, Andy's going to come and talk to you. Come on over, boys and girls, come on over. We stay down below, just stay down below. Come on over, come on over. Okay, I was, step back, I might need to move around a little bit, do I stand any fingers or toes? Okay. I was wondering, have you ever heard someone say something and you just knew it wasn't true? Maybe it was mummy saying, I'm just gonna run to this shop for two minutes. <laughs> yeah, that happens in our house too. Probably get a desk there here. Um, or maybe it's a brother or sister saying, I'll tidy my room later. Do you ever say that and you maybe know it's not quite true? I'm getting eyes over here from one. Or is it maybe daddy saying, I didn't eat the last Easter egg in the packet? Does that happen? Well, I thought, I looked online and I found some things that you might not think are true. And I want to see if you believe me or not. A little bit of copyright infringement here, but it's okay. So a little bit of a quiz. Will we let the, we let the adults join in too? We'll, yeah, see if they know if it's true or not. Okay, so what you got to do, I'm going to show you a question. And you've got to see if you believe me to see if I'm telling the truth or not, okay? So, the first question is, on September this year, the 23rd of September, the Nintendo company will be 135 years old. So, the Nintendo company, who makes things like the, no, that's not it. Who makes things like this, the Switch, yeah? This year in September, 135 years old, the company that makes them. Do we think that's true? Put your hand, I'll tell you what, let's, let's show of hands if you think it's true. Put your hand up if you think it's true. Oh, some hands, some hands down here. Some people are really, really doubting here. That's good. It's working out as I planned. So let's see. Is it true? It's true. And uh, the next image will show us originally the Nintendo company, I've got it written down here, was started the 23rd of September, 1889, uh, about 100 years before I was born. Uh, just a few years before Johnny Bell was born, um, as a trading card company um, in Japan, and then eventually they came on to make the switches. Okay, well, we make it a little bit more difficult. Okay, let's see, number two, let's see. Some people might get this in the room. There are trees so big that you can drive cars through, through tunnels that are made in them, and these are trees that are still alive. Now, it's pretty hard to picture that, but let's picture what size a car is. So I went outside, some of the cars that were double parked or parked across driveways outside. I took a measurement, and the average car is about this, lo this wide. So from the wing mirror to wing mirror, it's about this wide. Who, who thinks there's trees that grow big enough to build a tunnel? Let's see, is it true? Is it true? Oh, a few more adults know this one. Oh, there's a f it's not that you think it's not true. Let's see, let's see. It's true. Do you believe me just because I said it? There's the evidence. So this one, that's a Mini Cooper. It's not a very big car, but bigger cars can fit too. So this is called Chandelier Tree in drive Through Park in Leggett, California. It's a big redwood tree, and it is 84 meters tall. So anybody here about a meter? Let me see. Anybody here about a meter? 
about that tall. So 84 of those high, that's pretty tall. And then someone has cut a tunnel through the middle. Okay, last but not least, let's see this one. The world record for solving a Rubik's Cube is less than four seconds. So my wife pointed out some people might not know what a Rubik's Cube was, so I did this one earlier. <laughs> okay, so the aim, aim of the Rubik's Cube is to mix it all, is it starts off all mixed up. Oh, this is gonna, the people with OCD are gonna hate this. That was lovely. Okay, so it's all mixed up, all different colors, and you've gotta get it back to one color on each side. So this, the world record is four, less than four seconds. Who thinks it's true? Who thinks this could be done? And it, here, actually hands down, who here has ever solved a Rubik's Cube? <laughs> Do you believe them? Do you believe them with the hands up? Without cheating, okay? We'll have, a, we'll have a test later on. So who thinks it's true? The world record is less than four seconds to solve a Rubik's Cube. Okay, less people believe this. Well, in fact, it's true. Oh, so I'm pointing, there's two screens. Do you believe me that I've just told you? Do we need some evidence to see if it's true or not? Yeah. Well, I've got a video of the world record because it's actually, let me see the number, 3 point, oh no, or is it 3.14 seconds? Um, I believe, but we have a video that's hopefully going to work. So watch it, you'll blink and you miss it. So he gets a chance to look at it. This is him not starting yet. So it takes a wee second. Sets it down, so he's about to start. You ready? Watch him blink and you miss it. <laughs> Isn't that good? Anybody think they can match that record? That's pretty fast. 3.134 seconds. I, c I can't even say Rubik's Cube in 3.143 <laughs> seconds. Okay. Well, last week you were hearing all about the, road to the story in the Road to Emmaus. And you had the two disciples, and they walked with Jesus, and they didn't know who he was. And then when they sat down and he broke the bread, they realized who they'd been sitting with all along. And Ben took you around the church and told you all about that. The next part of the story happens really quickly because after they've run back, to Jerusalem to be with the other disciples, something pretty unbelievable happens. Jesus appears right in the room with them. And you think the disciples had been around Jesus for years and years and years, would know what's going on, but actually, the first thing they do is they don't believe it. Because we can read in the Bible, the, ver the verse that Kim will read this later, say, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And Jesus knows what they're thinking. He says, why are, you tr uh, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? So Jesus knows what's going on. He knows that they're doubting. They don't believe. A bit like when I'm telling those facts there. Lots of people in here didn't believe me. They didn't believe Jesus was actually there. But G Jesus doesn't judge them. And you know what he does? He provides some evidence. So a bit like the video of the Rubik's Cube or the photograph of the car going through the tree, Jesus says to them in the next verse, Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh or bones as you see I have. So Jesus was really there. He really rose from the dead. And he was convincing them with this evidence that he was really there with them because they didn't believe initially. I like the disciples because they're a bit like me. They're, they're a bit slow sometimes. They sometimes have doubts. They're not sure what's going on. You think after three years with Jesus, you would believe all the time, wouldn't you? but actually the disciples give me hope because sometimes I'm not sure as well. But Jesus is there to comfort us in our doubts. But you know what, boys and girls, the story in the passage we're gonna hear later doesn't stop there. There's an important next bit. You do watch it. Uh, there's an important next bit where actually later in the story, Jesus takes the disciples and tells them they have to go and tell others about what they've seen. And it's not just about in that room, but he says, you're going to go out as my witnesses, and I'm going to give the Holy Spirit to help you. And the, the, the adults will be hearing more about that later on. But it's really important that for you guys, as you go off into school and to play in and other clubs, that you go off and tell other people about Jesus too. Because what we know from this verse is he was real, he did rise again, and died for our sins and rose again as a real person and stood before the disciples. So it's important for you that it's not just you keep it to yourself, that you go out too as witness of that. So don't go and tell people how fast someone can do a Rubik's Cube or that there's cars you can drive a tree through. But actually the more important thing that was real that we see in the Bible that we have with us is that Jesus died for our sins and then he rose again and 
there's lots of evidence for that. Will we say a quick prayer before we go back to our seats and sing our next song? So everybody close your eyes. Dear God, help us when we have doubts to follow you, to read your word, and believe what you tell us there. We know that you are a real and living God through your word in the Bible. Give us the courage to go out as good witnesses, to tell others about all that you've done for us and that you've done for them too. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. So you're gonna go back to your seats and we're all gonna stand and sing together. Jesus is the name we honor. Um, just before Alistair comes up to do the main announcements, I just love two minutes of your time. I'm here with two hats on, one with a, an Exodus uh, staff member hat. I want to really thank you for all the support that you've given to Exodus teams over the years. Um, I know right back to when, when Johnny and, and Andrea started doing the, 
the first teams that SRPC did, um, they felt very supported, prayerfully, financially, and through encouragement. Um, and the second hat that I have on is as an SRPC member, um, I would love your support. We have an event coming up uh, I want to quickly tell you about. Um, it's on the screen there. Um, there are five SRPC connected teams going out this summer. I'm leading a team to Romania. Jack Knox is leading a team to Hungary. And then we have four of our young people. So Ben Harron, um, who, who comes to church and comes to Red, um, he hit the jackpot. He's going with me to Romania. I don't know if he would say that or not. Um, Beth Walker is heading to Moldova. Esri Clayton is going to Romania as well. And Amy Kajugi is going to Moldova. So five teams, two adults and, and four young people. Um, you can see on the screen, it's Saturday the 4th of May, May the 4th. I promise it's not because I'm a Star Wars fan. It was the only date that we could get where everyone's together. So I uh, would love to encourage you to come along to, to church from 10 a.m. to 12.30 on Saturday, the 4th of May. You'll hear a lot more about the team. And yeah, we would just, if, if you can't make it, uh, please, don't, please don't worry, but we'd love to have you along because I know it's a bank holiday weekend, but we'd love to have you along. And if you'd love to help out or even maybe bake some tray bakes, that would not be a, a skill of mine. So um, yeah, please do come and speak to me after if you want any more information or um, you'd be keen to help out. Uh, Saturday the 4th of May. Love to see you there. Thank you. Forgive me, I have quite a number of announcements. The first is from the PW. Uh, thank you uh, everyone for coming <clears throat> and donating clothes and tray bakes to the Close Swiss last Saturday. We raised £780 for the PW project. Well done. And this coming Tuesday evening at 7.30, we're looking forward to watching Joanna Henderson arranging flowers and telling us of her story. We would love to welcome all the ladies to the last meeting of the season. On uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday, the 17th, the prayer meeting uh, at 7.30. Please come if you can. Next Sunday, uh, we have communion, uh, so we can look forward to that. Uh, to the members of Tuesday break, uh, the trip to Union College on the 7th of May, uh, Ben is asking that you return the slips to either him or Iris or to the office by next Sunday, and there are some spare slips uh, on the table in the hub. Ben had mentioned last week uh, that uh, the Sundays in May will look a little different, uh, everybody may. Uh, everyone will gather at 10 o'clock, uh, for our JCBs and creche, uh, where you can leave very young children. But it's not just children, there will be an adult Sunday school uh, with a great lineup of different speakers from outside coming to help us think about understanding the Bible, praying, being disciples, and being peacemakers. At the same time, there will also be membership course, and if anyone is interested in being part of that, please talk to, to Ben. Uh, from 10.45 to 11.10, uh, there will be coffee, and then at 10 past 11, our worship together, shorter, all age, within the hour, and then a time for prayer ministry and conversations afterwards, and maybe on a couple of occasions, a walk or lunch. There will, Ben has promised, hopefully, a video next week to explain it further. Our own Gordon Campbell, who incidentally is the first uh, speaker in our Everybody May Sunday School, ha has a book out on Martin Luther's Bible. He's editor and lots of contributors uh, celebrating fi the 500th anniversary of Luther's translation. There's a book launch on Tuesday the 23rd of April uh, at 4 p.m. in the Gamble Library in Union College. If you would like to go, let Gordon or Ben know uh, this week, please. Uh, there is a prayer letter for those of you who don't receive it by email from John and Barita, again, which is on the table uh, in the hub. <clears throat> I'm also very sad to announce the death of Mr. Roland Wiley. Our love and prayers go to Margaret and her family. There will be a service of thanksgiving at McBriar's Funeral Home, St. Field, tomorrow, Monday, at 12 p.m. A little later, Alf will uh, be leading us in prayer and praying specifically for the family. I hope that's all the announcements. Kim's going to come and do our reading, and after that, 
Alf will come to pray. Our reading is taken from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 53. Jesus appears to the disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful passage from the end of Luke that Kim has just now read for us. We thank you that we have the Bible in English and that through that we can know and learn from what you told the disciples after your resurrection. We pray that you will also open our minds, as you did the minds of the disciples, to understand even more deeply what you want to teach us. Help us to understand even more what we are saved from, forgiveness of our sins, and also what we are saved to, a resurrection life clothed with power from above. We pray that your peace will settle on where we are troubled and will cover our doubts and deepen our faith and our worship. Bless Andrew as he teaches us about this passage later in the service. May your spirit power from above flow through him so that our minds and our hearts are enlarged with joy and wonder and belief at the reality of your resurrection and the meaning of your ascension to heaven. Father, we also pray for Ben this morning as he leads worship in Beaver. And we pray for our brothers and sisters in the Beaver congregation that they will know your presence and guidance. Lord, you said the truth about you will be preached to all nations. So we pray for the role that each of us have in doing that. Show us and guide us about how we should witness for you in the coming days. We also pray for those people who are serving overseas as a witness for you. We pray for John and Barita, Jonas and Marcus in Japan. We especially pray that your spirit will guide them as they seek your will for the next steps in their ministry in Japan. We pray that you will make it very clear where and how you want them to serve. May your spirit work through them where they are ministering now and in the future. Lord, be with Heather in these days as she continues to develop educational materials. May she know your spirit guiding her and working through her in all her relationships. 
And Father, we pray for Gerald, Louise, Jeremiah, Daniel, and James. We pray that their past week in Marsabit will have been fruitful for the young people involved in the Bible studies, that each person will have had opportunities to grow in their own faith and will now be equipped with new skills and knowledge to go and share with others. Lord, our hearts go out to all those people in Gaza and across the Middle East whose lives have been impacted so deeply by the current war. We pray for all those grieving and those who are heartbroken. We pray for those going hungry. We pray that aid will be allowed to get through to them. And we pray that you will stay the hands of those who want to escalate violence even more and that you will strengthen the hands of those working to bring peace. We pray that you will enable those negotiating for peace to find a way to bring about not just a short-term, but a long-term peace. Lord, we pray that you will be with those affected by the ongoing war in Ukraine. We pray that in the midst of darkness, you will bring hope. Lord, we also pray you will bring comfort to all those grieving after the knife attack in Sydney yesterday. And Lord, closer to home, we pray for Roly Wiley's whole family, especially his wife, Margaret, after his death this past week. We pray that you will bring deep comfort to them and indeed to all those who are grieving this week. Now, Lord, we take a moment to bring those who are on our minds before you, God. Lord, I pray your peace over every person here. May your love feel, fill each of our hearts. May knowledge and understanding of you grow in our minds. And may our hope in you lift each of our spirits and enable us to live with the same great joy the disciples experienced in the days following your resurrection. Amen. And now we will stand to sing two songs, Living Hope and He Will Hold Me Fast.
Good morning. Let me encourage you, if you have a Bible with you, um, to keep it open at Luke chapter 24 as we go through this passage together this morning. But before we do so, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so, Lord, we pray that as we turn to it now to read it, to study it together, Lord, that you would encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Lord, may you challenge us where we need to be challenged. And Lord, may you correct us in your loving and gentle way in those areas in our lives and in our thinking where we need to be corrected. And let it all be done for the glory of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, as we meet here in church, we are two weeks after Easter, two weeks after having celebrated the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But in our passage, two weeks has not elapsed. We are still in our passage this morning on that Resurrection Sunday. And so, to recap on the events of Easter Day so far, the ladies had went down early at dawn and they had arrived at the tomb, finding the stone had been rolled away. And of course, Jesus' body wasn't where they expected it to be. Two angels then appeared to them and they asked them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. And of course, then the women, they go and they find the 11 disciples gathered with some of other Jesus, some of Jesus' other followers, and they tell them all the things that they had found at the tomb. And of course, the disciples there are skeptical. They're not really sure what to believe. Do we believe Jesus is raised from the dead? Is He not? Is this just an idle tale? Has something else happened? And Luke documents for us how Peter runs down to the tomb. He goes, he wants to know, he finds the linen cloths all lying where they're supposed to be that had wrapped Jesus' body, but yet he walks away puzzled. He walks away pondering these events. And of course, then last week, Ben took us through this encounter of two of Jesus' disciples as they were traveling down to Emmaus, as they're journeying on this road, Jesus appears with them. And though at the time they don't know it's Jesus that is with them, He walks with them, He talks with them, and He teaches them. And as they arrive at Emmaus, they ask Jesus, not knowing who it was, stay with us, eat with us. And Jesus, of course, stays with them, and it's only at this point as He has broken bread and He has handed it to them that their eyes are opened and they recognize that this is indeed the Lord Jesus raised from the dead. And so, what do these two disciples do? Because in that moment when they recognize Jesus, Jesus vanishes from their sight. Jesus disappears from their presence. And of course, these disciples then head back to Jerusalem. They find the 11 disciples with some of other Jesus' followers. And of course, they tell them all that has happened. They tell them about how the Lord has risen and how He was with them on the road to Emmaus and all that had happened earlier on in that afternoon. And so, here we are on Easter Day evening. And verse 36 at the beginning of our passage opens with, "'As they were talking.'" And so, this is the continuation of events on this evening. So, as these disciples are talking, telling the other eleven and the others what had happened on the road to Emmaus, what had happened as they met with Jesus, as they were chatting, Jesus appears in their midst. Out of the blue, Jesus is there amongst them, and He says, peace be with you. The disciples are shocked. They're taken back. They're startled and they're frightened. They're looking at Jesus and they're wondering, where did He come from? How did He appear here? What is going on? And they're remembering the things, the events of this whirlwind of a day of how the women had been at the grave. They had told them that Jesus had risen. They were skeptical. They weren't sure. They were now hearing of these two disciples and their encounter with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And in the midst of all this, They're wondering what on earth is going on. Is Jesus alive? Has His body been moved? Had it even been stolen? And yet here's Jesus standing in their 
presence. And they think that they have seen a ghost. They were afraid. They were doubting. And they were troubled. And what is Jesus' response to their disbelief? His response is patience. And His response is gracious. Jesus says to them, look, look at my hands, look at my feet, touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And of course, Jesus here is holding out His hands and His feet, still marked where the nails had been driven through His flesh. And so, in Jesus' glorified body, He still bears the marks of His sacrifice, not in any way to diminish His resurrected body, but to show that He was the Lamb who had been slain, to give proof that it is I, this is me, these are the wounds that I have borne. And so, as the disciples are there with Jesus, this is a real physical human body. This is not a spiritual resurrection. This isn't some sort of resurrection that had Jesus' humanity, His human body, put away somewhere and somehow that it was a spiritual resurrection, as some have claimed. But rather, this wasn't even some form of hallucination. Rather, Jesus was standing physically in front of them just as He was before He died. And verse 41 tells us that they disbelieved for joy and were marveling. And so, as the disciples are here, as they're looking, as they're touching Jesus' feet, they are thinking to themselves, this is just too good to be true. I love that phrase, they disbelieved for joy and were marveling. What a weird bunch of words to put together. They, were, they disbelieved for joy and yet they were marveling. And so, here they were. Here is Jesus in their presence on this Resurrection Sunday, and they're just thinking, this is too good to be true, boys. How can this be? We watched Him die. We were, he was buried. And yet, even still, Jesus is gracious in His response, and He says, right, have you got any fish? Have you got any food? And you might be wondering, it's a weird request for Jesus. What's He asking for fish for? Why does Jesus at this point need fish? And the reason Jesus asks for fish is because He's not needing anything in terms of nutrition. Jesus is not looking fish because He's hungry. He's not looking fish because He's missed it for three days and He's thinking, I've been dead for three days. I need some food. I need some sustenance. Jesus isn't here thinking of Himself when He asks for fish. In this moment, when he asks for the boiled fish, he's thinking about the disciples. Because in this moment, in this asking for fish, Jesus is going to dispel their doubts because a ghost cannot eat. And you might be thinking that's a bit of a strange thing for a preacher to say at the front on a Sunday morning. But this is true, a ghost cannot eat. If Jesus was some sort of apparition, if he was some sort of spiritual being, the physical fish would not be possible for him to eat. And so, Jesus ate that piece of fish, proving that, look, you've touched me. I am here. I am physical, and I can even eat this piece of fish. And so, Christ in that moment ate for our confirmation. Jesus ate for our confirmation, proving that He said He was. And so, in this moment, at this point, we see that Jesus is really alive. Not just alive, as they had been heard, but here is Jesus in front of them, dispelling their doubts. Jesus, from this point, the disciples fully know that He is really alive. He has risen triumphantly from the dead, and here He is in their presence. And now that Jesus has showed them who He is and that He is really alive, what does He do? He teaches them from the Scriptures. Verse 44, Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke with you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. In other words, there was enough teaching in Jesus' early ministry that foreshadowed these events that were to come. There was enough in His teaching that told them, it should have given them a glimpse that the Messiah was to suffer, was to die, and that He would be raised again. And so, there should have been enough there that disciples shouldn't have been surprised, but yet they still were. And in Jesus opening their minds here to what was written about Him in the Law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms, we can see that there is no part of Scripture 
that does not bear witness to Jesus Christ. The Old Testament being divided into the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, all of it bears witness to Jesus. And then Jesus, just as He did on the road to Emmaus, He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures as He taught them. And on the road to Emmaus, Luke doesn't elaborate. He doesn't tell us which Scriptures Jesus used to show them these things. And even here in this passage, Luke doesn't tell us the specific Scriptures, the specific chapters and verses that Jesus goes to. But what He does give us in this account is He gives us Jesus' conclusion. And so, having opened their mind to see the Scriptures, having taught them from the Scriptures, Jesus said, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations. And so, at this point, Jesus is now linking the forgiveness of sins directly to His death on the cross and His resurrection. This now goes beyond His death and His resurrection. Forgiveness of sins is available only because of what He has come to achieve and how on the cross when He cried out, it is is finished. And so, forgiveness of sins is only found in Jesus. And Jesus goes on to state to the disciples, you are my witnesses. You are my witnesses of these things. I have been here proving my resurrection to you, and He promises to send them the gift of the Holy Spirit which he describes in this passage as the promise of my Father. And this is important because this now tells us that Jesus has the authority to send the Spirit. Jesus has the authority to send that which was promised by His Father. But the disciples are to remain in Jerusalem until they are clothed with this power from on high. And all of, this, all of this shows us again how God's redemption plan was, of course, no accident, but rather it has been planned out for God. This moment through, through Jesus' death and His resurrection, it was prophesied in the Old Testament. It has been fulfilled in Christ with His suffering, His death, and His resurrection. And in these verses, Jesus commissions His disciples to preach this gospel, to preach this good news to all nations. And in preaching the gospel, they are are to preach the repentance for the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. But if you notice the clause in your Bibles this morning, although this task is so great in scope to go out to all the nations there to begin by proclaiming that first in Jerusalem, proclaiming it in the city that had just three days earlier cried out for the crucifying of Jesus. And yet Jesus says, begin proclaiming this good news here in this city and then go out. And of course, we know from this passage that the disciples are not to do this in their own strength, but they are only to do it in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is a truth that we need to know and remember today, that as followers of Jesus, we ought not to preach the gospel in our own strength. We ought not to go out and try to convert people by ourselves, but rather we need to know that it is the power of the Holy Spirit, first and foremost at work in our lives, that leads us and guides us. And knowing that as we preach and proclaim the good news of Jesus, it is the work of the Holy Spirit that convicts people and applies the truth of God's Word to their lives. Only the Holy Spirit can and will do that. And we know from Luke's second volume, the book of Acts, that it's all about the work of this promised Holy Spirit as He sets fire to this church, as He spreads through signs and wonders, and as this Christianity explores or explodes through that region. They're only to do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And then we get to verse 50. And verse 50, for some of you might feel a wee bit out of place, because here we are in verse 49, we're still Jesus teaching His disciples on this Resurrection Sunday, and then we get when He had led them out. Forty days have now passed between the verses 49 and 50, and we know that 40 days have passed because if we were to flick over in our Bibles to the beginning of Acts, so Luke chapter 24 ends, Luke's gospel account Volume 2 is Acts chapter 1. In our English Bibles, we have John sandwiched in the middle, separating those two volumes to keep a bit of continuity in the Gospels together. But here we know that the book of Acts concludes with the ascension, or sorry, the book of Luke concludes with the ascension. The book of Acts begins with it. But what Luke does here in Acts, he expands on it, he goes into a lot more detail. But here at the end of his Gospel account, he simply summarizes the ascension of Christ. He simply just provides a short summary after he did all these things when he had led them out near Bethany. And this morning, there are two things that I think that we need to see from this very short summary. Let me read the words together, verses 50 to 53. When he had led them out, of the, out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he, was lift, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. And so, two things that we need to see this morning. Firstly, as Jesus blesses his disciples, he was carried away up into heaven. And so, the first thing that we need to notice is this taking away of Jesus, this separation of Jesus wasn't like the road to Emmaus. It wasn't like the disciples who had Jesus in their presence and then all of a sudden He disappeared from them. But rather, there was a finality to this moment because as He lifted up His hands, as He blessed His disciples, He was carried up into heaven and the disciples watched Him go. They knew where He was going. They knew that He had went into heaven. And something, sometimes I think that's something that we can overlook in this narrative, but there's something really important for us to grasp, and it's this. Jesus in His humanity is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And so, if you've ever wondered, if you've ever found yourself asking that question, where is Jesus? What is He doing? Well, in His humanity, in His human form, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and He is interceding for you and for me. And folks, for those of us who are following Jesus, that is incredibly good news this morning, because just as Jesus has ascended into heaven in His humanity, that shows that we too will be able to ascend into God's presence on the last day. We will be with God. Jesus has gone and showed us that it is possible. Secondly, this morning, this is good news because if you are under attack from the enemy, if you are being, if you are suffering under persecution from the enemy saying you are not good enough, you have sinned, you have let God down, you have done all of these things, Jesus in His humanity is seated in heaven and He is interceding on our behalf. He is interceding on our behalf, telling God the Father, this is what I have done for them. And so, when God looks at us, He is reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus, and that means you and I can be forgiven and stand in a right relationship with God, all because Jesus is there interceding on our behalf. And that is incredibly good news this morning. So, don't let that ascension slip by as a short summary, but let it remind us where Jesus is and what he is doing. Secondly, from the ascension, we see that the, the disciples worshiped Jesus. In that moment, they worshiped Him, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Now, I'm not sure how you are with farewells. I'm not so sure how you cope if you're at an airport and you're saying goodbye to friends or family. I remember back to 2019, whenever I was working for a mission organization called Abana, who work with children in Africa and Uganda, and from January to June, they had the New Life Choir over. 
these kids who were incredible kids who were traveling the UK and Ireland, singing, telling their stories, and encouraging people about the good news of Jesus and, and raising support um, for the work of the ministry. And it came to the day where we had to say goodbye to these incredible children and young people and their, their, um, the adults that were with them, their chaperones. And it was tough. It was difficult in that airport as the kids are hugging the friends that they have made here. And there's something about that as we kind of look and we're thinking, oh, it's tough. There's something that pulls on our heartstrings as we think of leaving friends, as we leave families. But the disciples here in this moment, they have a joyful farewell. They return to Jerusalem joyful. Jesus has left them, and yet they are rejoicing and worshiping Him. And that's because at this moment, the disciples now know more than what they had. They knew the promise of the Holy Spirit was coming. Jesus had taught them and said, it is better for you that I go, because when I go, I will send you the gift of the Spirit. And so, bringing all of this together, as Jesus proved to them that He really is alive, as Jesus taught them that He is indeed the Messiah, and as Jesus ascended into heaven, bringing all of this together with all of these facts, what are we to do with that this morning? With verse 46, thus it is written that Christ should die, suffer on, on the third day, rise from the dead, and that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There was a commission given to Jesus' disciples. And notice in God's timeline of redemption, it is written that the Christ should suffer. Check. He has done that. He has died on the cross. On the third day, He rises from the dead. Check. That has been completed in God's plan. He is raised from the dead and that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, yet to be complete. That part of God's plan has yet to be complete. That is the part of God's mission that is still ongoing. As I was preparing for this message this morning, I was challenged by this question. It will come up on the screen. More than 2,000 years later, how does the one remaining task within God's plan shape your own priorities and activities in life? How does the one remaining task within God's plan shape your own priorities and activities in life? And I have to say, that's something that I've been wrestling with over this last couple of weeks. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus 2,000 years later? And how does that shape? What is this knowledge that this part of God's plan is still ongoing? What does that affect in my life? And this morning, I want us to see that there are two aspects to this. There is, of course, our priorities and activities as a church, both here in St. Field Road and indeed PCI as a wider denomination. And secondly, there is our priorities and activities as individuals. This morning in our prayers for others, we've already been thinking about how as a congregation we support and encourage overseas mission. The work of John and Barita Timothy in Japan, Gerald and Louise Moangi in Kenya, and Heather in India. These are things that we are doing as a church, missionaries that we are supporting prayerfully, financially, encouraging them. At home, of course, as a church, we are making Jesus known here in our local community through the work of the Vibe, through Tiny Tots, SISM, who I know many of you are going to be on the SISM team, even hearing this morning from Dave of the, the young people and the, their leaders that are heading out to Exodus and heading out to Europe. These are things that we're already doing. And of course, there's our contribution towards the PCI United Appeal, which supports projects, programs, and staff both at home and overseas as we seek as a denomination to make Jesus known to the ends of the earth. But of course, then there's our call as individuals. There's our involvement in mission. We are all called to go, but what does that mean? Are we all called to leave South Belfast and get on a plane and travel? No, because the gospel was to be go out to all the world, and South Belfast is included in all the world. 
You might be called to go. You might be sitting here this morning thinking of missionary service, thinking of going overseas, and you're thinking, is that me? Is that not me? That might be you. God might be calling you to go and serve Him in a very practical way, reaching people with the gospel who so desperately need it, people who have never heard the good news of Jesus. Maybe we're called to invite. Some of us are a bit more introverted. We're not as good at going out and making those public declarations, but we can all invite. Maybe you're in university and the Christian Union is running an event to tell other students in university campus about the good news of Jesus and what He has done for them. Can you be involved in that? Can you invite friends of yours in university that you know who don't know Jesus? Can you pray for the power of the Spirit to give you the courage to invite them? Perhaps you're in work with a colleague who's open about the things of God, and they're wondering and they're exploring about what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean? Who is Jesus? And maybe there's an opportunity for you, as Ben was sharing a couple of weeks ago, to open the Bible with them and sit down and just read the Bible and talk about who God is, who Jesus is, and what He has done. Ben says it's one of the best parts of his week. It might be the best part of your week as well. Or maybe simply one thing that we can all do when we meet our friends this week, when we go into work tomorrow morning and they ask us what we did at the weekend, instead of focusing on the events of what we did on Saturday, we might be brave and bold enough to talk about how we were in church, how we were with our brothers and sisters in Christ, celebrating the resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus. In all of these things, we can be called to go. We can be called to invite. We are all called to prayerful support and encouragement of missionaries. We can all pray. And of course, there is the aspect here of even when we were looking at the book of Philippians and that partnership in the gospel, which Ben preached on a couple of weeks ago on that aspect of giving and how we partner in the gospel. And so, as we give financially to the church, as we give supporting those missions that are close to our heart. But the important thing to remember is going on mission is not about working for a full-time mission organization. Working for God full-time is not just the minister at the front who gets paid to talk about Jesus, but rather we need people who are doctors, who are nurses, who are teachers, who, are, who work for the local council, who collect rubbish, we need people in all walks of life, in every job, in every sphere, in every department of government who are believers in Jesus, who take the good news of the gospel to those workplaces. That is where the mission field is, and we're all called to bear witness to the things of Jesus. And of course, the reason that we're all sitting here today is testament to the men and women who have given their lives to the advancement of the gospel around the world. If the disciples hadn't have went in the power of the Spirit, we wouldn't be sitting here in Northern Ireland talking about Jesus. We're here because they went and the generation after them went and the generation and so on. And of course, it's already been mentioned, we have this incredible gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, in all things mission, in all things as we reach out in love, we do so with prayerful dependence and expectancy on the Holy Spirit, that when the gospel is preached, He will be at work in the hearts and lives of those who are hearing the good news. Folks, this is the greatest news of all. Jesus is the Messiah who suffered and died, who rose from the dead. There is forgiveness of sins to be found in His name alone, and He is currently seated in heaven, and one day He will return, and He will judge the living and the dead. We are living in that time between Jesus' ascension and His second coming, and our mission as a church is to go in the power of the Spirit and proclaim the good news of Jesus to all nations, and so let us continue to do that, both as we work at home and overseas. And as I bring this message this morning to a close, reflecting on that great joy that the, the disciples had in worshiping Jesus, there's two things that I want us to finish with. See as we finish. We should never 
be so caught up with serving God that we forget to stop and worship Him. I'll say that again. We should never be so caught up with serving God that we forget to stop and worship Him. And likewise, we should never be so caught up in worshiping Jesus that we forget to go. We should never be so caught up in worshiping Jesus that we forget to go. And so, in our response this morning, let us both be a people who worship God for the great things that He has done, and let us go forth from here telling anyone who will listen, maybe on the glider, on the train, on the bus, maybe a car sharing the way into work, but let us tell them the good news of who Jesus is and what He has done for us. Let us pray. Almighty God, there is none like You. You alone are our Lord. And so, Lord, we praise and we exalt the name of Jesus, for He is the Christ. He is the Messiah who came, who suffered, who died, and who rose again in our place, suffering on that cross to bear the wrath of Yours so that we could be forgiven rising triumphantly from the dead, proving that He was indeed the Messiah, proving that He was indeed your Son. And now, having ascended into heaven, He is seated at your right hand, interceding on our behalf. And so, Lord, we worship You and we exalt Your name. And Lord, we pray that through the power of Your Spirit, Lord, that You would come and You would equip us with everything that we need to proclaim the good news of Jesus, both here at home in St. Field Road, in South Belfast, and around the world. And I we pray that you would use our gifts, our talents, and our offering as we seek to make Jesus known to all who would hear. So we pray that you would indeed use our gifts to draw people to Jesus. Lord, that we would make disciples here who would in turn go out and tell more people of the amazing work that you have done. And it's in Jesus holy and wonderful name that we pray. Amen. The next song that we're going to sing and close our service with is something that has been on my heart this last week or so. It's a song that I haven't heard in a long time, but a song that I remember singing as a child a lot. It was written in 1992, and the line opens, great is the darkness that covers the earth, oppression, injustice, and pain. Nations are slipping in hopeless despair, though many have come in your name. I wonder if in 1992, when they wrote these words, watching while sanity dies, I wonder what they would make of the world that we're living in now. And so our prayer is as we look at the world around us, as we look at this great commission that we have before us, our prayer is, come Lord Jesus. We need your help. We need your strength. And our prayer is that He would indeed pour out His Spirit afresh on us today, giving us the boldness and the encouragement and that spark within us to go in the name of Jesus to that, for that glorious gospel to proclaim. So let us stand and let us sing this song of prayer together.
the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.